Okay, hello everyone. We're live with the one and only Neil Sinababu. Uh, he's a philosopher. He has written lots of interesting things. Uh, today we're going to be talking about one of them in particular. I, I th I've i previously described him as one of the most creative philosophers where he'll, he'll, he'll have these just like, you know, very wild ideas that like no one else would have thought of in a million years where like, you know, that have these very complex internal structures and it's all very interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, so the, the you know here we're going to be talking about the elect his paper on the electrons and love argument against divine fine tuning. So the fine tuning argument is basically it says you know if you look at uh, the laws of physics they are such that if you tweak them slightly, uh, no life could have ever arisen, no complex structures could have ever arisen. The universe would have just been this kind of soup of atoms, uh, not interacting in any meaningful way, or perhaps it would have all collapsed in on itself. And additionally, just as a conceptual point, it's easier to generate chaos than order. Uh, the vast majority of possible fundamental laws would not produce anything interesting. You could just imagine all these simple laws that are like all the particles move in a circle at one mile per hour, two miles per hour, or an infinite number of other speeds. Um, yeah, so so that's that's sort of the idea of the fine tuning argument. Neil, why is this argument wrong, and why <laughs> why do why does the possibility of electrons and love uh, show that this argument's wrong? Yeah. Uh, so to uh, uh, put it kind of nicely, you can sort of put this in the form of a dilemma. Uh, so uh, it's about whether the laws explaining which physical things have minds uh, hold necessarily or, you know, whether the laws of our world are just one way things could be. So let me do both horns of the dilemma. So let's say the laws about which things have minds could be a bunch of different ways. You know, in this world, it seems like something like a brain, something very kind of physically complicated is needed for mind. But if you consider other settings for the laws about what could have minds, uh, which you're kind of already in this game once you're thinking about other settings for the laws of physics, which the fine-tuning argument is, is thinking about, well, uh, if you're thinking about other settings for what has minds, uh, you can imagine a world where all it takes to have a mind, to have desire, for example, let's say, is charge. So the positively charged things want to be with the negatively charged things, and the negatively charged things want to be with the positively charged things. Uh, that sort of makes sense of their behavior as we see it in this world. The other thing you just have to add is the feelings associated with that behavior. And I think after that, the little things have minds. If electrons are just feeling so happy whenever they get with a proton, and the protons are just feeling wonderful when they get with a pro an electron, and then like a hydrogen atom is just a happy couple in love, well, yeah, we have microphysical particles with minds. Now, if God created that kind of world, he would have created an awesome world. Uh, and this shows us that uh, you can create awesome worlds without fine-tuned physical constants if you set the psychophysical laws in a mind-friendly way where protons and electrons have minds and fall in love. Uh, so what happens then is if you have the situations that, according to the fine-tuning argument, are uh, bad for uh, intelligent life, you can't have intelligent life if everything collapses into a fireball or blasts apart into uh, a, a sort of a big explosion going every which way with nothing bigger forming than a hydrogen atom. Well, you can have love in the blasting apart situation with every proton-electron pair, you know, forming a hydrogen atom, being a going on uh, that a god would be happy with. So what this shows us is uh, minds, intelligent life, all the good stuff, you don't need fine-tuned physical constants for it. If you have other possible settings for the psychophysical laws, uh, so you can have electrons in love. So that's one horn of the dilemma. And you might think, okay, this is really weird. Electrons in love, no, come on. You got to have like something like a brain to be in love. Uh, maybe there is all this talk of other settings for the laws is total nonsense. There is no such thing. Uh, some ph philosophers hold this view, and they think that these psychophysical laws have metaphysical necessity. The way they are, brains required, is the way they have to be. Well, if you have that kind of view, you can't run the fine-tuning argument because you lose the mind of God. Uh, in the fine-tuning argument, God is supposed to be the one creating space and time, setting the physical laws, uh, creating all the physical entities. Uh, so 
In that case, God can't have a brain. A brain is a spatiotemporal thing and a physical entity. God comes before those things in the fine-tuning argument and can't have one. There can't be physical stuff before God. God set it all up, and there are no laws when God is around uh, of the physical, I mean, until he sets them up. So that's the problem. You lose the mind of God if you say that brains are required or otherwise that psychophysical laws have metaphysical necessity. So either way, either you get the electrons in love or you lose the mind of God. Uh, and in no case does it come out that uh, you need fine-tuned physical laws uh, for mind and uh, God can be seen as an agent who fine-tuned those laws, which is what the argument is saying. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, um, yeah. So I agree with a lot of that. I think, like, if you think the are, if you, if you agree with mm -hmm. that, you get kind of two implications, which are first that theism does not especially strongly predict uh, that there would be fine-tuning, just because God could make a perfectly valu valuable universe, uh, even if it weren't finely tuned. And second, that uh, naturalism you know, really the relevant data, the reason why theism is supposed to predict fine-tuning better than naturalism is that fine-tuning is supposed to be a, pro a prerequisite for having agents who are able to engage in complex embodied experiences. Uh, and so then naturalism can also accommodate that and it doesn't need fine-tuning. Um, so so it, both, it both undercuts the predictive power of theism and then also means that, uh, you know, it's, it's good news for the naturalist. So, I mean, I guess a few worries about, about the argument. Um, so... I mean, the first one is, you know, I think you should take, you know, you take the most specific version of the evidence, which is the most specific version of the evidence is not merely that uh, we, that there are embodied conscious agents, but that there are embodied conscious agents who are not electrons, uh, <laughs> who are not plausibly electrons. And then the thought is, okay, what are the odds of that on theism? Well, on theism, you know, maybe it's kind of plausible that he'd make the electron universes, but it doesn't seem inconceivable that there would be something really valuable about making a complex universe like ours where we're able to interact with this physical world. Maybe it's not super likely, but it's at least not totally implausible such that you give it maybe 10% odds. And then the thought is, well, you know, on, on, on naturalism, the odds of this uh, are, are going to be ridiculously low just because even if your argument proves that you could have a simple world that have electrons in love, as long as we're justified in thinking we're not electrons in love, that we, you know, we're in fact actual people who, you know, we're not, we're not protons and neutrons, uh, then, uh, then naturalism, I think is going to, is going to be worse explanation because the relevant data is not merely that agents exist, but it's instead that agents exist in a finely tuned world. So I'd, I'd be curious what, what you think about that. Yeah, so uh, to say some things about uh, the moral uh, betterness of having us than an electron, I'm just not convinced by this. I actually think the electrons in love world is, as far as I can see, overall a better world, uh, because there's just a lot of advantages of having these little things that it's harder to break. I mean, our bodies break down and we die, which kind of sucks. And it seems like a really nice God could just give us like proton and electron type bodies, you know, so we just like last a lot longer. I mean, it, things could be like that. And, you know, I don't know what all the other junk that like goes on with us is, is that good for. You can just put all the important psychophysical laws, set them up and, and have, you know, microphysical particles who are super special in all kinds of ways and, you know, have more uh, morally valuable experiences than us. They do interact with the outside world, I want to say. I mean, in the same way we do. Uh, all the forces in the world, you know, all the charge that's present in the world, you know, does its vector force stuff on the electron, all the masses do their gravity stuff, and, you know, nearby... want. Uh, you could have just uh, extra properties that God puts in where if, you know, uh, uh, six electrons make a perfect hexagon, they all rejoice in the glory of God. You know, you could just like stack this up with all the beautiful stuff you want that, that we don't have around here. And uh, that makes me think there's just like our world, I mean, it's kind of like the problem of evil a little bit. There's just so many better worlds that could be made. And a lot of them are electron worlds, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, right. So I, I, I what you're saying, I think it's, it's decently plausible. But um, well, so I, I think the, the point is just the odds of fine tuning, just given how, how low it is, you know, are, are so infinitesimal that even if you're like 95% sure that you're right, then given that the relevant data is that, you know, we're not, we're not electrons. It's like, if you think that, if you think that there's a 5% chance that God would find something valuable about putting us in a world like ours, rather than, rather than creating the electron world. Um, 
and you know, we, uh, we can give all sorts of explanations of what that thing might be. So my preferred theodicy is, is something like God wants to put us in a world that looks roughly like the typical world would look uh, that, that doesn't contain God, where mm -hmm. like, you know, for, for a sort of similar reason why a spouse might sort of take a little, you know, take a little break so that their, you know, their spouse could see just how, you know, how, how much they depend on them so that it might strengthen their relationship. You might think that God does a similar thing, or you might think he has unknown reasons to put us in a world like that. Um, uh, where we're these sort of embodied animals interacting in the world produced by, through, a, through a process like natural selection. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not certain of any of this, but the claim is this, at least it's, it's sufficiently plausible that, um, God would do something like this, that the, the probability of fine tuning is still going to, um, is still going to swamp the probability or the prob yeah, the probability of being in a finely tuned universe conditional on theism is going to swamp it on atheism. Right, right, right. Yeah, I I'm just not sure what to do about these situations if you're saying that, like, so we have a bunch of laws that seem fine-tuned, uh, essentially. One law, the thing about which uh, physical states give rise to mind, just seems completely off script as far as fine-tuning is concerned, and as far as we can tell. I mean, if we're in a panpsychist world, everything looks completely different, but then then I think fine tuning also isn't necessary. The, the actual world ends up being sort of a counterexample uh, because we have intelligent life all the way down or something. Um, so because of that, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, if, if the fine tuning argument is just about all, it's sort of like you have all the physical laws, but one set up right. Why wouldn't it go some other way? It, it, do you have any thoughts on that? Like why, you know, God didn't fine tune that one and fine-tuned all the others? Is there some story here? I mean, you could have done it a whole bunch of other ways. And then I, I'm not sure what happens to the probabilities once we allow for probabilities of, okay, maybe God would make mind-friendly laws and then like, you know, uh, uh, mess up or mind-friendly psychophysical laws and then mess up one of the physical laws and everything would be just fine. Like the strong nuclear force gets super weak. You can't form stars or large elements, but you can, you can have the happy proton-electron couples yeah, so and give them all the mentality you want. So the question is why God would like make it so that we're in a world where the psychophysical laws don't seem finely tuned to like yeah. produce life. Yeah. Well, so, um, so I think you'd want to say that, so, okay. So my broad picture is I think that God, to the extent that he exists, I'm sort of, my credence has gone up since we last chatted, but it's sort of, I'm still, you know, maybe a bit below 50%. Um, uh, uh, I think you, you think God would create every possible person because just because, you know, it's good to create a happy person. And so God can create every happy person. And then he would put them all in the world that's best for them. So if that's true, then it doesn't really matter how long he waits or how many worlds there, how many people are in each world, because he would just put people in whichever world happens to be best for them. Um, and so then, uh, then the question is, okay, are the psychophysical laws uh, in some way badly designed such that not merely based on not making very many agents, but are they badly designed in other ways uh, in that like, um, you know, they cause us to experience all this excessive pain and, you know, uh, they have, a, you know, cause all this vice and so on. And I think they are, but I think just whatever you think about the problem of evil, uh, is going to, um, it, it is going to cover the problem of psychophysical evil, which is why the problem of why the psychophysical laws are not very good. So it, I, the, the broad point is if your argument for it to be successful, like relies, um, you know, re requires sort of the, 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 that the problem of evil is, um, successful, like I, you know, it's just, it's important not to double count the problem of evil evidence where I agree, like it, it, the problem of evil is very strong evidence against theism, but my claim is problem of evil, is strong evidence against theism. And then there's this additional piece of evidence, which is very strong evidence for theism, which is that we're in a finely tuned universe. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, there's a little moment where things cut out, uh, there, uh, but I, I think I got the gist of, uh, your response. Just, this is just on the problem of evil and, uh, 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 it's sort of relationship to the fine tuning argument. So the way I kind of saw the big debate was uh, problem of evil is essentially where uh, uh, atheists are on offense and uh, theists are on defense because that's uh, the place where I think the the you know atheist has sort of the strongest case for yeah look this is decisive empirical evidence against the existence of God. Um, and uh, fine tuning is supposed to be the thing going the other way. So here they sort of meet each other. You know, uh, and the 
you know, what we should be seeing here, what I think would be evidence of God is if things here, just like if you look at the world, does the overall structure have uh, things God would want to a high degree? I mean, the, the fine-tuning argument does rest on some ethical claims about, uh, uh, you know, what would be good and God being good, uh, because I take it that's why God is making the minds, uh, because uh, God is good and wants the good stuff to be around. Uh, so when these arguments meet each other, we are basically confronted with the question of, is this world overall something that looks like it was designed by a supreme, a perfectly good being? Uh, that's just sort of uh, something that both the fine-tuning argument and the problem of evil are engaging with. And, you know, I, the, uh, the imperfections of the world seem to uh, suggest uh, a perfectly good God is not the creator. Uh, maybe you can get some kind of case for uh, a, I mean, some kind of force that favors some uh, physical complexity or something like that. Uh, but that just falls so sh far short to me of God. And then we're not even as, I mean, you could have more physical complexity if you really wanted. Uh, so I'm just not sure, you know, how we're getting to something that has the overall profile of uh, even the God of the philosophers, let alone any gods of actual religions here. Yeah. Yeah. So I would agree. I think the fine tuning argument itself is not enough. Like the fine tuning argument, all it sh gives is a reason to think that there's some God who wants to finally tune the universe. Uh, and then if you combine it with a problem of evil, those together give you a reason to think that there's a God who wants to finally tune the universe, but isn't perfect, particularly morally good. But then I just think that there are other other reasons to think that that if there is a perfect being, that it's it probably is. Or sorry, if there is a creator of the universe, then then it probably is a perfect being, based on the fact that I think that's a much simpler hypothesis. Based, on, you know, there there are just lot there are lots of other things about the world that I think are better explained by a perfect being. Um, and so the 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 point would be that um, that I, like I, I you know I agree. Problem of evil, it's a very strong consideration, and I think if you just look at problem of evil plus fine tuning. I think problem of evil, it's probably more evidence than the fine tuning argument is. And it's probably, um, uh, and you know, if you, if you buy both of them, then you should just think that there's some, some indifferent creator. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I took, I took it that the idea of the, the electrons in love paper was to kind of like mostly defang the fine tuning argument. Yeah, yeah. And my thought is that, you know, maybe the problem of evil is still a lot of evidence, but just, I don't, I don't think it does it successfully defangs like it'll it'll cut the probability of theism by a bit because you know there's a, there's this new plausible story of what kind of world that god might create uh a world with all these electrons in love but i i don't think that it'll it it'll undercut like i still you know just given how narrowly f tuned the constants are i still think it'll be pretty strong evidence for for theism right um, let me get into the sort of probability estimates. This is just something I don't know about. So, and you've been thinking about, I, I know the, the, these probabilities uh, recently a lot. Um, so suppose, I mean, the situation with, okay, suppose our fundamental laws, we've got uh, a strong nuclear force, electroweak gravity. Uh, I, I don't know if, if that's the way to think about them, but suppose, you know, we have those, I guess there's also the cosmological constant or something like that. I don't know if that's independent of these things, but if you have those, uh, so there's like maybe four laws that seem really fine tuned. And then a fifth law that's just like completely, you know, doing something else, you know, with those, Because I'm wondering if the probability of minds should be antecedently pretty high because, you know, uh, by setting the psychophysical laws really mind friendly, yeah, you can just like get minds with all kinds of junk. Uh, and so the other laws don't really matter that much. And the overall probabilities that seemed really low of things working out for minds in the initial fine tuning argument, the way it's presented from people just focus on the physical laws, actually don't end up being so good once you see that like one thing has completely come loose. Uh, so do you know a way to like assess those numbers? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's, you cut out for a bit of that, but I, I think I, I got I got the broad picture. Um, uh, so, I mean, 
I think what you want to do is you want to look at the total evidence, which is we exist in a world that has conscious beings um, and we're not electrons. And then you'll try to look at, okay, what's the probability of that on atheism versus theism? And it, because of the fine tuning stuff, I think it's, it's very low on atheism. And I think that uh, it'll be higher on theism. It, you know, making sense of the precise probabilities, it's, it's going to be kind of difficult. But you can, you can sort of set a lower bound. You can sort of set rough bounds on it where like conditional on atheism, um, or at least on a broadly naturalistic picture of the world, the probability that the fundamental laws would have the exact low entropy state that it does at the beginning of the universe, you know, that the share of phase space that that is, is according to Penrose, one share in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of five, or uh, sorry, 10 to the 10 to the 123rd. And it's like, you know, the uh, naturalism gives you no reason to favor one particular share of phase space over another. And so then the odds of th that you'd get this really low entropy state will be will be kind of absurdly low. Well, that's that's fine. But I mean, if, if the low entropy state doesn't really matter, which, you know, it might not matter if you have psychophysical laws that allow high entropy states to, to have minds. I don't know why the laws couldn't be like that. Yeah, the, the laws could be like that. But um, I, I you know, you want to take into account the total evidence, which is and the total evidence is that given the way the psychophysical laws are set up, in order for there to be minds, there has to, so the total evidence is there are psychophysical laws that require brains for minds, number one. And number two, uh, uh, um, you know, they're all, you know, there's, there is this vast concoction of events that are extremely improbable that result in brains um, and result in physical structures like brains. And the thought is that even if the odds of you getting minds at all conditional on theism, on, on naturalism are decently high, the odds that you would get brain minds in the particular way that you do, where um, you know you have, give, given the fine tuning stuff, the probability of that will be a kind of absurdly low. Yeah. Okay. So l l let me just uh, try to uh, think up some other hypotheses for what like kinds of entities could have minds, uh, and j just to show that like, well, uh, so it, it is true that brains with minds, if you if you run it through that. Uh, you do get sort of low probabilities of things being that way. Let me just give you a different kind of scenario. So suppose we have a high entropy scenario. Nothing has much structure. There is just kind of a flow of, you know, particles just kind of moving around one way or another. And, you know, they never make anything especially big. But suppose just like some bits of that flow. You know, if, if, if things are going in uh, a certain kind of uh, northward direction, or I, I don't know how to, you know, characterize directions, if, if some stuff is moving a certain way, that agglomeration of stuff ends up being kind of like uh, a minded entity as long as that, you know, kind of continuous flow exists. And then, you know, if, if, if overall that kind of flow goes away, then there is no mind. There's just a lot of ways to just take regions of space time with stuff put laws on them and have minds. You can just kind of do this in a lot of ways without too much structure. And electrons in love is one way, but you can just do it lots and lots of other ways. I mean, you just need physical with some stuff and then you get minds with stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, you could have that. But my, my thought is that um, theism at least makes it not terribly unlikely that the ideal mind would be sort of that the ideal things for minds would be kind of like they are in the physical world, where the minds can seemingly direct the, the physical, you, you know, you have a body, you're able to Im implement all these motion, complex motions, uh, you're, you're able to interact with the world that can be affected by other things. You know, there are all sorts of theistic explanations of why something like that might be of particular value. Maybe that's especially good for soul building. Maybe that's sort of what the most likely worlds would look like absent God. And so you're kind of uh, you're, you're kind of in a, in a similar situation where like theism, theism gives you a reason to think that like, uh, uh, you know, that it would be sort of like God taking his vacation uh, in the, the case I described before. And so m my claim is, I don't think, I, I don't know that this is super likely, but it's at least not terribly improbable. Um, uh, and then the thought is just on atheism, the odds that you would have. Um, so then that means that theism predicts specifically minds generated by brains that can influence bodies in, in this complex way. Well, atheism makes that very unlikely. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so theism. So is there a reason why uh, brains are better 
than uh, sort of arbitrary slices of an entropy world. Uh, is, is, is there something to be said there? Um, I mean, I think so, maybe. Like, you know, with brains, we have this ability to predictably interact with to predictably interact with the natural world. Uh, now, maybe, you know, you could have the mind maybe direct the movement of the atoms in the entropy world. But, um, you know, maybe there's something valuable about, you know, like this facilitates a greater, uh, greater kinds of relationships. It makes it so that God can be sort of more hidden where, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit hard to think about what the goods would be um in a world where like you know we were just these mind slices from a region of complex entropy yeah um, but but my thought is uh, you know and so maybe they, all the same values would be realized it's just it's a little bit hard to think about like what the goods would be in that world how the goods would be would be different so my claim is just the odds that you'd have a world like this one are not terribly improbable mm -hmm. and um I, you know i think i think that's all we need um, oh, yeah. And so, you know, even if even if you don't think there's any super likely story about why uh, a world like this one is especially valuable, as long as you think, okay, not terribly improbable, then it's going to be good evidence for this. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah. I, I. You know, I, I think all the things that sort of uh, seem uh, uh, especially nice about our world and make it a bigger target or somehow a better target than the sort of entropy world for a divine being. Yeah, I just worry that we're sort of doing this in a deeply conservative way. You know, the things that we see around here are the things we think are valuable. And, you know, if things were different around here, we'd think different things are valuable. The entropy beings might think of, if, if they ever think of our world, you know, they might just be kind of like, whoa, could you imagine that being so stuck, you know, in, 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 in the situation like that or, or having to die or, I mean, well, maybe they die too. Uh, I, they're just like, I mean, that our bodies are exactly as they are. I just, I got to figure out what exactly supports the value of that. Uh, and I what worry that we're just being, you know, falling for a conservative bias here. Things are good as they are. And if things had been otherwise, we would have thought different things were good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's possible. But like, again, the question is like, okay, how certain are you that we're falling for a conservative well, I'm bias? I'm unusually certain because as a moral philosopher, you know, I'm a, I'm a hedonic utilitarian who works a lot, worries a lot about the reliability of uh, moral intuition. And so uh, because of that, I'm kind of thinking, you know, that's one big thing people do. Like, you know, I'm just thinking about my... Uh, grandmother who uh, lived on an Indian village for all her life and was just astonished when I, I told her like, yeah, some days I don't eat rice, you know? And she's like, what? How, how can this be? And she's like, you, 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 uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's other things to eat. Yeah. So yeah, people yeah, do rice, this. Rice is on the objective list. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> for grandma, it was. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, there was a, uh, it's, it's a rice place. And so, yeah, that's, this is what you do if you're in rice country. And, you know, we're in body country, as it were, brain country, uh, yeah, so totally I, speaking. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like, it, yeah. it's all, you know, it's possible that there's a conservative bias, yeah. but, um, I, I'm not so confident that there is a conservative bias that, you know, I think I think it's enough to uh, um, uh, that it's enough to be like super certain that um, that that you think that it it'll significant that fine tuning will not still be you know massive evidence for theism. And I you know there's some more things you can say about it. So uh, you know okay I mean here's here's one aspect of our world where. The, the brain seems to store information very similar to what's going on in the mind. So that, you know, when we kind of open it up, uh, we, 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 so, we sort of observe that, um, you know, and maybe there's something valuable about having the physical system kind of like pair track with the mental system where it, even though, you know, as a dualist, I think there is, there's a sense in which there's a ghost in the machine in which it's at least like, it's at least coherent to think that, where like like the machine resembles what's going on with the ghost rather than being sort of this this disconnected causal influence on that. So maybe there's something val there's something valuable about being in a world like that. Uh, and the entropy world, like 
you know, with the beingless die, it seems like their their lives, you'd either have to have them be much too long or much too short, mm-hmm. where like, you don't want them to spend too long on Earth because, you know, the afterlife's really yeah. good, but you don't want them, you know, if there's some reason to send them into a world, you wouldn't them, want them to just be there for like four seconds, which would be typical of most <laughs> entropy things. The entropy things would like, you know, they would massively spread out over time. Uh, now, you know, the, the the individual plausibility of any of these stories is sort of grabs and i think you know the more if i had more time to think maybe i'll write an article about like you know reasons why you might prefer this world to, to like a high entropy or electrons in the love world but my thought is just odds are not terrible that there's some reason it means fine tuning is still going to be good evidence for theism um mm. where and i think this is broadly kind of a, a trouble with approaches to the fine tuning argument that proceed the way sort of similar to yours does because so i think Yours can be, it can serve as both a reason why fine-tuning, why a life-permitting world is decently likely, or or a consciousness, a conscious agent-permitting world is decently likely on atheism. And I think, I think maybe, maybe that's right, but uh, um, the, uh, the odds on atheism of a conscious life, of a consciousness-permitting world that's like ours are very low, because mm-hmm. one that's like ours requires fine-tuning. Um given that, you know, we're, we're in a world where there, in fact, are finely tuned constants. And so then I think, you know, for your argument to, to have, have very much force, it has to attack the probability of the constants being this finely tuned conditional on theism. But my thought is, I just think that the odds are going to be just so ridiculously low that of the fine tuning on atheism that mm-hmm. you have to have a, like, you know, 10 to the 10 to the 123rd. <laughs> That's a big number. You have to be really, really certain um, and you know that's just one of the many numbers. Uh, you have to be really, really certain in order in order to think that uh, of, of the argument to think that it has anywhere near as much force as the um, as the problem as the fine tuning problem does against atheism. So I, I guess this is a sort of roundabout way of saying I'm just I'm suspicious of hypotheses that attack um, the probability of fine tuning conditional on theism because. I think while that that might be part of like that that might be part you know if you have a good explanation of fine tuning and then you say oh and also the odds on theism aren't that good okay then you know then in conjunction those those that's kind of bad news for the theist but I think just uh, an argument that by itself may lowers the probability conditional on theism is not not going to be super good. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so what we have here the real the sort of evidence for fine tuning is just. Uh, physical laws uh, hanging together in a way that give you some big stuff. Uh, it, 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 it's unclear here whether we are the big stuff because minds you know, can be had in so many ways. Uh, it could be something else. It could be, I don't know, stars or uh, 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 the solar system or, or any number of other things. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's, that's really like what it is. Uh, because I'm just seeing this big gap between, the, I mean, there is an improbable thing that happened with the constants, but that just seems to me very far away from the desiderata of minds and other stuff that really makes you think, okay, there's actually a omnibenevolent being, a god or something like that. I mean, really what we're, what we might want is some kind of like cosmic structuring event or something like that. Uh, perhaps, uh, there were a lot of junk universes that didn't have constants fine tuned and somehow they like fell apart in some multiverse kinds of things like, uh, uh, you know, have some kind of pull here. Uh, so that's really what we're trying to explain. And it just seems to me like a rather different, you know, desideratum. I mean, God, I, I can see why it comes up because like, where else are we getting our constants from? I mean, there, we don't really know where those come from. We don't have good explanations of those. They're fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, you, you cut out for a moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I tried to stop because I was cutting out and I didn't want to like talk more then. But uh, yeah, so so that was just kind of the idea. Um, I Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I agree with you that like, um, you know, if the argument were just, look, theism has conscious agents, that's very likely on theism, very unlikely on, on naturalism. Um, I agree that that alone wouldn't be as strong as evidence for theism. But the thought is that conscious agents of the type that we are, where we're in this universe with, you know, mass and stuff, and like this big stuff that hangs together, 
the probability of, of that is uh is is very low um okay i mean you know let me just uh, sort of uh, uh take this in a new direction uh you know do you think we can figure out stuff about god's values since you know consciousness could have shown up a bunch of ways uh so do you think that like maybe what this shows is uh the good stuff uh really is like you know solar systems you know that's you know that's really what god likes uh um, and forget about forget about us you know. yeah i mean i i think this would might be evidence that the good stuff is solar systems but like i think we have independent very good reason to think that the good stuff is not just solar systems um well, I mean, the the, 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 the things you were finding valuable uh, that connect sort of moderately to us, uh, you know, you know, I, I kind of can't see the, you know, what blocks us from sliding further out away from uh, anything, you know, deeply connected to the human mind all the way out to just like large structures that can only be had with, uh, with these numbers uh, 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 exactly as they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the thought, I, I just think, you know, you should think that the odds, like, for theism to be plausible, you have to think that a good god is kind of special, where, like, it's not that there's some a conditional on there being a god, just your prior probability, most of the probability space, or at least a significant chunk of it, should be uh, in the direction of a good god, because it's like, maybe it's simpler or something. Well, you know, I think it is simpler. Um uh, you can have it get it from just a single property, which is unlimited goodness, where yes. goodness is this fundamental thing, and then you just take this fundamental thing and then set no limits on it. And yeah, that's a very simple theory of fundamental reality. Yeah. Um, and then, the, and then, okay, so you know, there's a good being like this. Okay, maybe this being like solar systems, but like I just think we have good reason to think that a good being would want other stuff more than solar systems. If you don't have a reason to think that. Like, if you don't have a reason based on priors to think that the vast majority of the, the of the space of possible designers uh, is occupied by a, a perfect being, the vast majority of epistemic space, then this isn't even a good argument for design because for every possible, for every conceivable world, there's a conceivable designer who would design just that world. And so unless you have some reason to think that one particular designer is special, just the fact that there's a world or at least some, some subset of designers, there's no reason to think that uh, a designer would be especially likely to design a finally tuned world. But if you already think that theism is like an okay hypothesis, then I think it's, it's a better explanation of, mm. of design. So uh, does the uh, simplicity of a good God change with the complexity of the good? So if we start having a more complicated theory of the good, then does it become sort of like less probable that God is perfectly good? Whereas maybe if you have like, you know, a utilitarian theory or something like that, that makes the good simple, that's a more probable. And do you know how those probabilities interact? Because if we're now contemplating ethical theories on which, you know, there are fundamental bases of value that are just like diverse and complicated and all the complexity of our world is set up to get them all, uh, you know, or, or a lot of them, uh, uh, then does that, does that affect the case for the simplicity of a good God at all? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think I think it it might it might not. I think if you're a moral naturalist, then it'll be kind of uh, then then it, it'll be weird to think that like if you think that con that morality is this kind of natural property, then just just as a world with maximum heat won't actually be a simple world. Because to have heat, you need to have atoms buzzing around at very high speeds. So really, heat it sounds simple. But it only sounds simple, you know. It's it's reducible to this other stuff, and so actually, when you you know the details, it's it's not that simple. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, if if you're if you're not a moral naturalist and you think goodness is fundamental, then yeah. So would would a theory be simple on which the more fundamental moral facts are are kind of simple? I, I, I don't I don't really know. So like, um, and here's here's one way to think about this. So imagine that. Uh, that we're we're evaluating the plausibility of Max Tegmark's hypothesis, uh, where he thinks that every possible mathematical structure is instantiated. Now, just mm -hmm. just assume moral plate or mathematical Platonism's right, and that mathematics is sort of fundamental; it doesn't reduce. Um, 
like, is that theory hurt by knowing about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, where you know there's no it, the mathematical facts don't all reduce to this one set of axioms? I, I'm not so sure. Okay. Um, maybe it's a, maybe it's somewhat bad news. Maybe it's not. I don't really know. Um, yeah. What one one other kind of objection to the the electrons and love argument that that I was thinking about is, I, I think. Um, I think you're going to need kind of the, a similar type of fine tuning, uh, just to fine tune the psychophysical laws. So, okay. You know, with the electrons, yeah, you could have the electrons in love and having these valuable relationships. Uh, but the, you could also have the electrons just have one simple property, fear all the time, <laughs> um, where that's all they think, or have the experience like eating a red bell pepper or something or some unimaginably simple experience. Um, I, I think that the, the, the psychophysical laws that say you have all these electrons and they interact and they, ha you know, they can fall in love and have these valuable experiences. I don't think that those are going to be the simplest set of psychophysical laws. And I think that the number of different psychophysical laws that are just like chaotic and random in comparison that don't have any value is going to vastly outnumber those those set of psychophysical mm. laws. Okay, uh, you know, the thing is that uh, some of those uh, uh, incredibly sort of weird, simple experience worlds, uh, at least some of them, I'll, you know, I guess a lot of them could plausibly be better than our world, I think. And uh, there are some that I think pretty clearly are, like heaven worlds where things are always experiencing pleasure just seem better to me. And if you just had like all happy fundamental particles, that seems just way better than we're doing right now. I mean, as I see this ethically, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if even if the particles were flying around, just, just, you know, mildly enjoying a red bell pepper for their entire, like all of eternity is little particles that have a nice taste of a red bell pepper, you know? And they like it, you know, just, you know, a little bit. Okay, that just seems like a great world to me. You know, uh, there is all these people of the, uh, actually some philosophers. Uh, uh, I'm in Austin, Texas right now, uh, where Brian Cutter did his PhD. And I know he and uh, a lot of other smart folks, Brad Sad and other folks have uh, uh, discussed uh, psychophysical harmony uh, as an argument for God's existence. You know, I just kind of find myself sort of left cold by these arguments because I just don't see that our harmonies are the best harmonies. Uh, there just seem to be a lot of better ways to do things. And what we have here seems kind of mediocre. Uh, and there's just other ways for psychologies to be that I don't know why I'd say uh, this way for things to be ordered is better than all the other ways things could have been ordered. It seems that the other ones are, you know, nice in their way. I mean, I don't want hells, but, uh, you know, uh, the fear world seems like a hell more or less. Uh, but uh, yeah, or, or, you know, something like that. But, you know, as it just, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, I feel like we're being overly conservative in dismissing all kinds of weird options uh, that might look like, I don't know, someone's really fun drug experience forever. You know, <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's plausible that a lot of these worlds would be better than ours. But yeah. we have to distinguish between how good a world is during its time on Earth and how good of a world it or not sorry not during the, the world is not on earth how, how good a, a world is during its duration and how likely it is to be made by by a god because the thought is the red bell pepper world that that might be a better world than our than our actual world but because there are no great goods that that might unlock for an afterlife i claim the odds that god would make that world in particular are basically zero one contrast oh. the odds that god would make a world kind of that's kind of like ours where we're able to have all these, you know, good and bad experiences that maybe contributes to soul building or something. The odds of that are, are much higher. Where like, I'm just, there's no plausible story on which God would make the bell pepper world because, you know, why wouldn't he instead make the, like, everyone experiences just immense bliss world. That is, that is a strict upgrade over the bell pepper world. Well, I think, um, well, 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 I agree that the pure bliss world is more likely to be made by God than our world. Um, I think the, it, there's at least some stuff you can say about why maybe he'd make our world uh, instead of the the pure bliss world, uh, which is you know basically everything anyone's ever said about theodicies, um, <laughs> uh, which uh, which doesn't apply to the bell pepper world. So as a result of that, I think that um, the the odds of a world like ours, where there's kind of like this striving and uh, um, uh, which is the world that we in fact find ourselves in. Um, 
that that worlds like this are much more likely. The other thing is, I, I just think that it's not true that, uh, you know, okay, maybe the bell pepper world's pretty good, um, but there there are just all sorts of worlds where there's there would just be no pleasure or pain, where it's just like people have the experience, have just some random experience. They just have a single thought where about some proposition of any of the infinite number of true propositions or like, you know, where they don't have any pleasure or pain in response to that. It seems like pleasure and pain are these more complicated emotion or these more complicated experience that require more complicated psychophysical laws. Well, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the odds of, yeah, the odds of the, like, it's, it still seems like the, the odds of those worlds are going to outnumber the, the pleasure world. Here, here I, I actually think quite differently about these things. I mean, the psychological symbols, uh, whatever they are, you know, uh, at the psychological level uh, uh, might simply be, you know, uh, well, at the phenomenological level might, or phenomenal level might be things like brightness, volume of sound, and like a hedonic tone dimension. So uh, it's the more complicated stuff than that, the sort of like, you know, causally interesting stuff, like, uh, I don't know, the way desire is wired up, that seems to me, you know, more complicated, whereas uh, every sort of dimension of experience seems uh, sort of simpler. Uh, and then, you know, if we I, so I'm not really sure where our world stands in the ranking, but I worry that an ex a world where every particle just experiences the color blue and no pleasure or displeasure, you know, might be superior to ours just because of sheer amounts of animal suffering. And, and, and you know, if it, hey, if, if we are net negative, better to have a blue world, you know, than, than you yeah. know, this. Yeah, I, I suspect that um, I think on atheism, you should think that the world is neither positive nor negative because oh. you should think it's infinitely large and infinities don't break down neatly in that way. Um, but but yeah, yeah but, so but, but I mean, re remember the, the point about just like, you know, the, the question is not whether it would in fact be a better world. I agree. OK, it's pretty plausible that if the earth were converted to just being filled instead with atoms eating bell peppers <laughs> uh, or experiencing eating bell peppers rather decent chance that's an improvement given how how you know many quadrillions of animals are experiencing horrifying agony um uh but my, the th i think that even though that world is probably better it's less likely to be created by god and in fact there's about a zero percent chance that it would be created by god because there's basically nothing you can say in favor of that world over the just pure bliss world where everyone rather than having mild bell pepper experiences has just immense unbelievable bliss Okay, you know, uh, one, uh, at a certain point when you were appealing to the afterlife as an important thing for uh, God constructing a world, that's something that I couldn't really see uh, uh, the special value of. Uh, you know, why do everything in a two-stage way? Uh, uh, I mean, why not? I mean, if we're doing that, why not have like many stages uh, or or just one? Or I, I can't really figure out what the, you know, what that's supposed to do. Uh, do you have a, a, a thought about that? Oh, the thought the thought was not that you'd expect on theism there to be like m multiple stages, a first life and an afterlife. Mm -hmm. I agree that if all you knew is that theism was true, then you would think, okay, probably like I would just expect everyone to be in the bliss world. Just God makes all possible people and gives them um, unimaginable bliss. So the fact that that's not the world, okay, that's evidence against theism. But given that we we look out and we realize, okay, that's not the world, um, you should think, okay, the best theistic theory is that God has some reason for putting us in a world like this for a little bit, um, but probably not that will last forever. And the odds that God would have a reason for putting us in a world like this for a little bit is much higher than the odds that he would have a world the, a reason to put people in the bell pepper world for a little bit. Because it's sort of a low level bliss situation actually seems more likely than this, because uh, assuming we have just a little bit of pleasure in with the bell pepper experience. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think so. So if, so, you know, we're considering two hypotheses. Hypothesis one is God would have some reason to have put beings in a world like ours for a bit. 
And the other hypothesis is God would have good reason to put beings in the bell pepper world for a bit. I think that the theory that he'd put have reason to put beings in a world like ours for a bit is much better than the bell pepper theory because uh, if um, there are at least things you can say the sort of the theodical stories about why, you know, in a world like this where there's all this soul building, that's better. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it sort of, you know, shows us what life's like in the absence of God, which strengthens our relationship with God. Maybe there are some unknown reasons, but, you know, it, it at least seems like it's not terribly unlikely that, uh, well, actually, I do think, no, never mind. I think it is terribly unlikely, but however unlikely it is, the situation is much worse for the bell pepper world, where there's not any plausible story you could tell about why one would make the bell pepper world. Um, because just the bell pepper world is strictly inferior to a world of pure bliss. Um, well, in, in our world, I agree that our world is probably, it probably is inferior to a world of pure bliss, but there's at least something you can say about why maybe uh, our world might be part of some, some grand providential plan. Well, you know, so we have, I mean, the thing that's special about our world is its extraordinary physical complexity given by uh, the fact that the physical laws interact uh, in such a way that we, you know, get interesting structure. That's, that's I think, the special thing. Uh, I don't know whether uh, that's a more plausible thing for a perfect being to care about than bell pepper phenomenology or pleased bell pepper phenomenology. Um, I mean, they both seem pretty arbitrary to me, you know? Uh, but, you know, speaking as someone who doesn't even like bell peppers that much, I can't see why that's a worse, you know. Yeah, I don't uh, either. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of, I think that's one of the hell worlds. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I mean, you know, I'm just kind of like, all right, if I got some pleasure in it, I could just like turn this from like, I don't know, I kind of like celery. So it would be like, yeah, I can just. Oh, just... that's even worse. Oh, yeah, you that's, think so? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the real hell world. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. A lot of people don't like celery. I'm unusual. Um, But uh, yeah, yeah, so. uh. Yeah, that's just like, I, I, I mean, uh. yeah, um, well, it just, I mean, th compare the quality of the theodic. So th it wouldn't be that God wants a world that has big and complex things. It would be that God wants a world that has some of the qualities of the actual world, right. like that, yeah. um, you know, we're able to enter into these valuable relationships, yeah, yeah. Uh, where, you know, we, we go through all these hardships and struggles. And the claim is that the the odds that a perfect being would put us in a world like that compared to the odds that he'd put us in a world okay. with, are at least much higher than the odds that he'd put us in a world where we just have the experience of eating bell pepper for sounds good i mean if, if you want complexity i mean uh we can do better than the bell pepper world in our entropy worlds i mean there's just all kinds of chaos going on there that you can just slap mental stuff onto and get all kinds of complicated things. So, you know, you have like a cube of space, maybe if it's unoccupied, no mentality, but if the particles in it flow around like that, it's thinking this, if, if that, it's thinking that. If it relates to the next one over, you know, uh, in a certain way, then within that cube of space, you know, they, they have this kind of shared experience. I mean, you can build all this stuff up, whatever kind of thing you want. You can just, I mean, this is just play around with the psychophysical laws. And if you want more complexity, you can set them up in just any place. Um, you just like use cubes of space and just like have the events within the cubes and how they relate to each other and all that, you know, do the work. Yeah, I mean, so so there we're back to the, the earlier point about whether in fact a... Uh, yeah. a world like ours is there's at least a reasonable probability that such a world would be created over a, you know, um, yeah. over a, a world over like, you know, one of the electrons in love world conditional on theism, because if, if you think, you know, each of the electrons in love worlds is likelier than ours conditional on theism, then, uh, then the odds that there would be a world like ours given theism are, are vanishingly small because, uh, you know, it's just beaten by all the electrons in the love world. But my thought is, given that worlds like ours are these kind of broad class of worlds where there are these complex structures, where we can interact with the world in, in certain ways that seem unique to these complex structures, where the world at least kind of like, um, you know, when you carefully investigate it, it, at least in many ways appears kind of godless, where like, you know, there isn't you know that and it there isn't super obvious divine providence uh it, it it at least you can tell it the world looks sort of naturalistic 
I, I think the odds that there would be something valuable about a world like that are at least better than the odds that there would be a world like that, uh, than, than the odds that there would be fine-tuning conditional on, on naturalism. And so as a result, I, I still think, I, I agree, there's a real challenge, and this will cut the probability of naturalism by quite a lot, but um, I, I think I think, I think think overall, uh, the theory is not, um, I, I think overall fine-tuning is still going to be evidence for theism, even though this is another consideration, this is a consideration that will lower the probability of fine tuning or sorry of theism rather okay well i should probably head off now so uh uh, uh I, I hope you managed to uh chat with me about the stuff you wanted to chat about yeah yeah i did yeah so thanks for coming on i thought this was a lot of fun always yeah. always good to have you always you know interesting thoughts yeah, yeah. wonderful all the best with the things you're thinking about matt and uh, i'll see you later probably yeah all right take care Great. bye, bye.